Just past the turn of the century, Boise, Idaho was bustling with growth. From 1900 to 1910, its population tripled to over 17,000. Automobiles were still a rarity, and the city streets hadn't yet been paved. But houses and businesses were springing up everywhere, and the city limits were being pushed outward. On the northeast corner of 11th and Sherman Streets, newlyweds Will and Nellie Hunter were renting their first home. Will had recently secured a job as motorman on the interurban electric railway that connected downtown Boise with communities west. Nellie was a refined, hard-working woman of 21. Together, they worked to make their home a place of comfort and simple beauty. It was here on November 14, 1907, that their first child, a son they named Howard William, was born. When Howard was five months old, Nellie took him to fast and testimony meeting at the Boise branch, where the branch president, Heber Q. Hale, gave him a blessing. Nellie, who descended from pioneer ancestry, was an active member of the branch and made certain her children received religious instruction, both at church and at home. Though Will was not a member of the church, he did not stand in the way of his family's participation, and occasionally, when work permitted, he would accompany them to Sunday evening sacrament meetings. One of Howard's warmest memories is of coming home from sacrament meeting on the streetcar in the arms of his father. In 1909, the family moved around the corner to a larger home at 1012 Sherman Street. It was here that Howard's sister, Dorothy, was born. The next year, Will bought a quarter-acre lot just outside the city limits at the end of Vine Street, and soon he was busy constructing a three-room frame house for his family. Will bought a small hammer for two-year-old Howard and let his energetic son pound nails into the living room floor. In the fall of 1910, the family moved from Sherman Street to their new home. Since there was only one bedroom, Howard and Dorothy slept on cots on the south half of the porch. Howard and his sister Dorothy were close. On hot summer days, they liked to cool off with their dog in a nearby irrigation ditch. Howard was always so good to me, Dorothy remembered. I have never known my brother to do a wrong thing in my life. In the evenings, while Howard lay on the living room floor at his father's feet, Will would ask, where shall we travel tonight? Then, armed with an atlas and encyclopedias, they would explore exotic places of the world. His sister remembers that Howard was admired by adults for his good manners. He would tip his cap to people on the street and give up his seat on the streetcar if anyone was standing. From his earliest childhood, Howard possessed an unusual work ethic for one so young, and adults seemed to sense that he was conscientious and dependable. As Latter-day Saints, Howard and Dorothy were in the minority at school, and he remembers, it wasn't very popular to say that you were a Mormon. But Howard had a testimony, one that had developed from earliest childhood. I knew that God lived, he remembered. My mother had taught me to pray and to thank Heavenly Father for all the things that I enjoyed. I often thanked him for the beauty of the earth and for the wonderful times that I had at the ranch and by the river and with the scouts. I also learned to ask him for the things that I wanted or needed. Will felt his children should wait until they were older to be baptized. As a result, Howard's 12th birthday came and went, and he was unable to pass the sacrament with the other boys in the ward. Howard repeatedly begged his father for permission, and finally, on April 4th, 1920, he and Dorothy were baptized in the natatorium a large indoor swimming complex. Eleven weeks later, on June 21st, Howard was ordained a deacon by his bishop, Alfred Hoganson. When Howard was 15, the saints and Boise met to discuss a proposal to build a tabernacle to serve a growing church membership. When an appeal was made for pledges, Howard raised his hand and made the first one, $25. 
a substantial sum for that time, especially for a teenager. I worked and saved until I was able to pay my commitment in full, he remembers. He was present two years later when the completed tabernacle was dedicated by President Heber J. Grant. At an early age, Howard discovered a talent for music, and by the time he reached high school, he could play at least five instruments. He began playing saxophone and clarinet with several dance orchestras, and in 1924, he organized his own group, Hunter's Crunaders. Toward the end of 1926, Howard received an unusual offer, a contract to provide a five-piece orchestra for a two-month cruise to the Orient on the passenger liner SS President Jackson. For a young man whose only travel had been to relatives in Utah and California, this was a rare opportunity to see the world and at the same time, earn money for college. On Friday, March 11th, 10 weeks and one day after they had boarded the train in Boise, their journey ended. It was early in the morning when we got to Boise. I called mother and dad and they came to get me. Home never looked as good to me as it did when we got there. Howard was thrilled when he returned to learn that his father had been baptized in his absence. The next Sunday, he proudly accompanied his father to their first priesthood meeting together. Howard Hunter was one of over two million people who moved to California during the 1920s, a time of unprecedented growth. People were flocking to Southern California from all over the country. It would become known as the first westward migration of the automobile age. Within a short time, Howard was as busy as he had been in Boise. His parents shipped his musical instruments to him, and that summer, he signed on as drummer for a dance band that also had a contract to perform on radio. About this time, Howard also began an in-depth study of the scriptures and other gospel-related books. But it was in the young adult Sunday school class that he experienced a major turning point in his hunger for gospel knowledge. He wrote, Although I had attended church classes most of my life, my first real awakening to the gospel came in a Sunday school class in Adams Ward taught by Peter A. Clayton. He had a wealth of knowledge and the ability to inspire young people. I studied the lessons, read the outside assignments he gave us, and participated in speaking on assigned subjects. I suddenly became aware of the real meaning of the gospel. I think of this period of my life as the time the truths of the gospel commenced to unfold. I always had a testimony, but suddenly, I began to understand. In March of 1930, in the mission home next to the Adams Ward, 22-year-old Howard Hunter received his patriarchal blessing from George T. Wright, stake patriarch. The blessing stated that Howard was one whom the Lord foreknew and that he had shown strong leadership among the hosts of heaven and had been ordained to perform an important work in mortality. <laughs> 